welcome in to Life in the Light. I'm Pastor Mark Jackson. I get to serve as the lead pastor here at the Light Church. We're going into worship in just a minute. Thank you for tuning in to Race, Riots, and Religion. It's a summer of critical conversations. You're going to be blessed. Well, let's go in. I'll see you in just a minute. Watch this. Come on, everybody. Oh, we come to worship you. Say, see you. Oh, oh, oh.
Welcome in, family. Hey, what's up? This is Pastor Mark Jackson, lead pastor here at The Light Church. I want to welcome you into another edition of Life in the Light. Listen, I hope all month you've been enjoying a summer of critical conversations, race, riots, and religion. I want to thank everybody who's commented, who's subscribed to our channel, who's invited someone to watch. Tonight is gonna to be amazing. We're gonna continue in the conversation. If you missed the prior two conversations, go back to our YouTube channel. You can actually watch those on demand. Do me a huge favor, subscribe to our channel. Like this if you want to, it helps our algorithm. But man, I want you to, to enjoy this conversation. I wanna see your comments. I wanna connect with you. Go to the lightchurch.us to stay connected with us. You'll see everything that's going on here at The Light Church. All right, everybody, we're getting ready to go into this conversation. Even before we go into this conversation, I wanna challenge some of you to give. Would you do that? Right now, everybody take something out that you can give to our church to bless us, and I believe that will continue to help us be able to do all that we're doing. It's right there on the screen. You can text to give. You can go to our website, thelightchurch.us, and you can see how to give there. And not only that, man, you can Mail it to P.O. Box 567, Youngstown, Ohio, 44501. For those of you, while you're online, man, make sure you connect with us on all of our social media. And not only that, I want to send you what we're calling the Light Love Care Package. We want to send you communion for this weekend. And many of them have already went out, but we'll do whatever we have to do to get that to you. Everybody, please stay with me. Share this with somebody. This is going to bless you. We're going into this conversation. Give something. Help us to continue to get this word out. Let's go in. Watch this, friends. We're going to have a great time tonight. This is good. Go ahead. Well, I think it's interesting. You, you had asked us earlier about the All Lives Matter pushback that we start to see uh, when BLM became, you know, a part of the forefront in terms of the national consciousness and the attention. I think one of the reasons why uh, people push back with that is because it's, it, it neutralizes the call to action that, that Pastor Todd was talking about, that we need to. I think white moderates are known for this, affirmation without action. They'll, they'll talk a certain way, but then they won't do anything about it. And the problem with neutralizing things, like neutrality always helps the oppressor, always. Never helps the victim always helps the oppressor. I think this is why the phrase all lives matter is used as a tool to silence those who have lived with trauma, people of color who live with trauma uh, historically. And, and so I think I want to touch on that. Second of all, you hear a lot of people talk about riots and black rage. How about we talk about white rage? 400 years of colonialism, where they riot and loot, primarily stealing bodies and land historically. So I think it's interesting to me how everybody wants to <laughs> throw attention towards black rage and then ignore the larger historical context of white rage and white looting, which is colonialism that has stolen bodies and lands for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I just, uh, I'll throw that in there. We cannot hide that narrative is out there. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Harrison real quick, if you would, uh, speak back on that. Thank you again, Pastor Harrison, for bringing us together on this past weekend. What a powerful march. Uh, what a powerful statement that we're coming together, even as black men coming together. I'm excited about the all men march where all men are coming together, black, white, Hispanic, African-American, Asian, everybody. We're coming together. Uh, so go ahead and speak to it, Pastor well, and I'm not I'm not going to do the pushback thing either, but uh, I'm the oldest one on this group. And so with that being said, the rioting issue, I understand it. Um, it does get attention. It does get results. The only thing that I struggle with is when it's our community, we do it to. Mm. That, that's where my problem is. That, that it, it's writing um, uh, 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 another store or something, okay. But when I burn down my neighborhood, who rebuilds it? Because there's no money in it anyway. 
So, and, and I think what usually happens, and I'm going to say it again, we get angry for a moment and we go right back to business as usual. There have, I'm, I'm giving I'm give, give an example. Give an example of this is what happened to me at 528 Lincoln Avenue. And I don't know if anyone on here remembers this, but I was bringing together uh, politicians, Republican, Democrats, all kind of people. I was having these town hall meetings. People were coming together and for the first time we were actually getting ready to move forward and they vandalized my church three times. Wow. N nobody said a word about that. They came in, they broke into the church, they came in and they kicked down the door to my office to send me a message to stop. There's a gun that was in my drawer. And I, I could tell y'all about the story. Young man came to Christ. He gave me his Glock on a Sunday morning in front of everybody, his bandana That's and his Glock. Church. That's that, during church, during church. He did that. He gave his life to the Lord. I left that gun in my drawer as a reminder of the ministry that God has permitted me to have in Youngstown, Ohio. They broke into my office and took the gun. Now you read between the lines what the next move was going to be. Wow. So here's my thing, and, and I think Bishop said it best. If you're not getting in trouble, you ain't doing nothing. If people aren't tearing up stuff because of your voice, you ain't doing nothing. I know that's bad English, I'm sorry. <laughs> If you're if you're not making waves for the betterment of the people, all you are is a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. And there has to come a point, and Dr. King is very clear in this, that there's some things you have to be willing to lose, even if it's your life, for the betterment of other people. And we don't have those prophetic voices anymore, except for Pastor Todd. We don't, have, we don't have those people who are willing to say, okay, if I got to die for my people, so be it. We're, we're cool when we're in the bunches and in the mobs and in the groups. But how do we act when we're by ourselves? How do, how do we act when we're with the other people that we're grinning at but marching against? That's good. I just needed to throw that little oh, bit. Oh, that's good. That's and good. one more little piece. Please do. When you were talking about the look in the officer's eye when he had his foot on his neck, I don't know if there's any hunters in here, but I've seen that look. That look is, I just got my trophy. Hmm. That is something that goes back to the inception of slavery where black men and women were never considered to be human beings anyway. We were nothing but animals. And the look in his eye was, I just killed another animal, not a human being. When he put his hand in his pocket, that's the trophy pose that I just killed something that wasn't human and has no value. Wow, wow. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna ask Jordan to come back and share a little bit as well in response to everything that you've just heard. And I will say this too, Jordan. I'm not an advocate for somebody to throw a brick at somebody's establishment. I will say that. I'll say before you throw a brick at somebody's establishment, maybe vote. Perhaps vote. Because a lot of times we take action when it's too late. I think we should be a little bit proactive and register to vote, do our homework of who we're putting in office. Um, maybe the black community can even come together and really communicate who who's running for office. What is their agenda? What are they going to do for the plight of those who are along the margins of our society. What are they going to do to push forward our community to help those who don't have 
Uh, we have probably millionaires in Youngstown. I'm sure we do. Uh, and somebody might be offended by me saying this, but we probably have millionaires. I don't understand how there can be millionaires um, and yet people on the street that have nothing to eat and we not do anything. Um, that's why I'm so grateful for those who, who are giving, who are helping our church. I'm sure many of your churches are helping. Um, but we need to be proactive and put people in place who are going to be advocates of change and change for the better. Jordan, go ahead and share your, your thoughts. Oh, I definitely agree with what um, Bishop Harrison had to say. But um, I, mean, what I... What I was saying, no, I just playing with you. I'm fine with that. <laughs> no, no, and I agree. I was single thought minded there trying to respond. <laughs> but no, I do agree people need to vote, but I also think that um, there, no that quick. opens up another, conversa another conversation of the privilege and the access to education and resources and understanding how important it is. And this is why almost every conversation we can have that says what black people need to do to be better and to come together, still well, there's a revolving door that goes into white supremacy and colonialism and things that we are not able to get access to as easily and as freely and as openly as other races. And, um, and so I agree that voting changes things but while voting changes things, what, what do those access points look like? You know, um, and historically they aren't, access, it's not accessible. The information is inaccessible. We are, we like, if there's so many conversations we can have like, oh, if black people eat better then our outcome with COVID-19 would look a lot different. But then let's talk about the fact that we can't eat better because there's food deserts and there's not access to healthy foods. And that when there is something that's organic, it's put at Whole Foods which is ran by a billionaire who could give a crap about black people, you know? So like all of these conversations, while they're very valid and I agree, yeah, voting, yeah, eating healthy, yeah, all of these things that would progress us as one, there's still so many things underneath it that have to be uprooted that we just as a whole don't have access to. Me as someone who was raised in the suburbs and, and close proximity to whiteness and being white skin, I have access to things that other people don't have access to. And I'm very aware of it. And that's why I will always speak up and speak out when I have the opportunity. But um, I don't know, like, yeah, voting. And, <laughs> but there's a whole other conversation that has to come when we talk about voting. That's good. Um, and that wasn't even my initial response. I kind of got a little lost, but. Yeah, um, that's okay. Yeah. That's good. I want to ask um, uh, Takesha to, to to hone in on this just a little bit. And then I'm, I'm gonna shift the conversation. Thank you for those of you who are watching tonight. We're not gonna be uh, too long. I just wanted to do this conversation on race, uh, riots and religion. And I'm so grateful. Those of you who are subscribing to our YouTube channel, who are uh, connecting with us on Instagram and uh, on our website, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna invite Takesha uh, to this conversation because uh, it's important to me that laity is represented uh, not just leadership, but leadership and laity as well. And uh, just speak a little bit to this whole um, Black Lives Matter versus the All Lives Matter pushback. You want to share a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, so I think when you say All Lives Matter, it's just a complete disrespect to the actual purpose of the movement. I don't believe when someone says Black Lives Matter that they're disregarding all life. I think the issue here is that all lives aren't being affected at this point. Right now, the people that are being affected are Black people. Um, it is historic that Black people have been suppressed. It is historic that there is a social injustice here. There is a that our judicial system is just awful when it comes to Black lives. And I think that when people are saying all lives matter, they're completely missing the point of what the Black race is trying to convey here. And that is just to say that they need to step up. They're trying to be heard, as many have said on this call already. They're just trying to be heard at this point. They just want to see, uh, they want to see change. And at this point, I have a lot of educated black sisters and brothers and basically they, they're tired. They say, I have a PhD. My father has, you know, his master's degree. They're trying to do everything the right way. There's been a lot of 
hear say here like black people aren't educated or you know that that stereotype that they're aggressive they're uneducated they're this but when they are doing everything the right way and they're still oppressed then what does that mean which way do we go at that point uh there was a there was actually a really good instagram video that i that i saw and this gentleman going back to what we discussed earlier he was just dressed down no one knew that he was FBI undercover, okay? So you have this white officer that approaches him and is kind of telling him what he needs to do. Uh, there was a warrant out for someone's arrest and they tried to just arrest him and make him do whatever they wanted him to do. And it, and it was terrible because he was asking for proof, why me? what gives you any indication that this is me and the guy couldn't give him anything other than you fit the description but what oh, exactly is the description yeah. is, is it the description because i'm black because i look like another black man is that what the description is what gave you um any kind of foot you know foothold that it's me that i am let's say takisha who said i was takisha who said I'm not Katie? So it was kind of amazing to see when that when that man pulled out that badge, the guy had to back down. So I think um, again, it kind of just goes to the movement is we matter. Black lives are the ones that are being completely affected right now. And so for anyone that says all lives matter, it's just a complete sign of disrespect to what the actual movement is. It's kind of like just saying they're being dismissive of it oh, well, you, you matter, I matter. It's like saying, hey, that person's house is on fire, that person's house is on fire, um, but what about my house? Hey, I need you to mow my grass. And I know it sounds really minuscule to say that, but it's truth. It, nobody realizes the severity of what's happening here, and they're just minimizing the movement when they say all lives matter. That's my thought on it. Thank you, thank you. That's so good that you shared that. I want to switch the conversation. I'd be remiss being a doctoral student of black theology uh, not to mention the name Dr. James Cone, uh, who just went to heaven last year, as many of you know, but pioneered the advancement of black theology. And if you're unfamiliar uh, with him, please read everything you can by, by Cone. Uh, Cone was an American theologian. Uh, he was best known for his advocacy of black theology and liberation theology. And in James Cone's Book, the Cross and the Lynching Tree, he turns our attention to and explores um, the paradoxical relationship between Jesus' death on the cross and historical lynchings of blacks uh, by Southern whites. Professor James Cohen, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. What did you draw on to do your, your theology? As a professor, as an author, it was trying to bring together Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement together with the Black Power Movement, this symbol of being black in a white racist society. King interpreted the gospel in such a way in which the blackness of his identity was not at the center. Malcolm, a Muslim, rejected Christianity because it did not address his blackness. So, I wanted to address my blackness, but yet at the same time, I was a Christian. I was born a Christian. I couldn't leave that. That faith was the center of my life. But the way in which that faith had been interpreted in the seminary and also generally in the dominant interpretation of it in America, which King largely adopted, also had a white Jesus. Now, how are you going to get a European white Jesus in Palestine? You can't get that. But with white theologians, you can get almost anything out of Jesus. So they had reinterpreted Jesus so he looked like them. So I wanted to bring the blackness of my identity together with the faith that I had learned in the church. And it was that that brought me to want to interpret the Christian gospel. So, in black theology, which I developed, the blackness in that phrase comes from Malcolm X. 
the theology in it comes from Martin King. So I bring Martin and Malcolm together, the civil rights movement and the black power movement together in order to develop a black theology of liberation. In our culture today, there are a number of prominent authors who say that religion is a primary cause of violence. In fact, it's almost too dangerous to be tolerated. Do you see a connection between religion and violence? I do see a connection between religion and violence, but I see that collection, connection largely in terms of many people who are religious are the victims of violence, like black people, mm -hmm. uh, and they have used religion in order to respond to that violence. And that's what the civil rights movement was, using religion in order to empower poor black people to resist violence. But dominant religion is always explicitly violent against people who have no power. Any religion that's in the hands or in, uh, are the instruments of those who are in power militarily, economically, and politically, and religiously, if they are the dominant group, like white people are in this country, religion is going to be violent. But that's true anywhere in the world. I've been around the world. Anywhere I, religion has been in the hands of those are in the, as instruments of those who are in power, religion is violent. But for those who are the victims, religion can often be used as a means of resisting the very violence in which that is being inflicted on them. I'd like to stay with the violent side for a minute. All right. For those in power, does it seem violent? I mean, there are certainly people who say, for my religious convictions, I am now going to inflict violence and, and, and feel empowered by that. But I, I think you're talking about people who might not see themselves as violent. Yes. I mean, most of the people who, who were very religious in the South, where I grew up, did not see themselves as violent. They interpreted violence with the Ku Klux Klan. They didn't see segregation as violent. They saw segregation as a way of life. But any dominant group in any society that's making the rules and the regulations and by which that society is run, they are being violent against those who have no say in what those rules will be. Is there a way that religion specifically feeds that? Uh, because that, that could go with power in general, couldn't it? Yes, it could go, with, but religion is never completely separated from power. You don't get pure religion. You always get religion connected with the people. And you have to ask yourself, what position do they have in the society? Are they the ones that make the rules by which the society is organized? If they use religion for that, and if they are religious, they will use religion for that. So anybody who has institution, any group, that has institutional power, they are violent. Therefore, the mainline denominations in this country have been violent against black people. And I can show it, show you that from the time of the, about the 17th, 18th, 19th century, all the way down until the 21st century. If you are part of the dominant group in this society, you are being violent. Now, you use the term white supremacy to describe not a Ku Klux Klan idea, but the state of affairs in our country today. Yes. Is that, could you talk about that? White supremacy is white people making all the rules and regulations by which this country is defined. There is one black senator of the 50 who are there. There's only one. That's white supremacy. There is, the, you know, nine Supreme Court justices. All of them white as far as I'm concerned. One may look black, but he's white. So that's, that's what I mean by white supremacy. That is white people's rules and regulation defining how the community and the society is going to be run. That's all it means. 
And white people control most of the economic resources in this land. They control the political process. They make the rules for all of that. Marginalized aspects of black religion and black theology came into being in order to address that. But you will not have many white people who are addressing white supremacy. They will interpret religion and the Christian faith in such a way as if that is not relevant. That itself is white supremacy. A major focus of your work today is the cross and the lynching tree. You're working on a book on that. Right. What does the cross tell us about religion and violence in our culture? Well, I think the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, was a first century lynching. And it was very violent, in which Jesus was lynched. Well, America has a tradition of lynching, in which America lynched more than 5,000 black people in this land. The Christian church said very little about it. It was very violent lynching. So if we understand the cross correctly, we will see it as Jesus being a victim of lynching, a victim of violence. So at the heart of the Christian faith is God taking upon God's self the suffering of the victim. So if Christians in this society want to understand what the crucifixion, what the cross was all about, they have to see it, particularly in America and the United States, they have to see it through the lynching experience. That's the only way they'll understand what was happening at that cross. When you see a lynched black body, that's who God is. God is present in that body just like God was present in Jesus' cross. So the cross is very violent, in which God has taken the violence of sin in the world up on God's self. And if Christians today want to understand what that means and what it caused them to do, they have to see it through the experience of lynching within this country. And I'm sure his, uh, his social critical analysis and hermeneutic of the cross was star startling to many whites, but the reality of many blacks. And Cone's book is a memoir on the painful experience of being both a Christian and a black man in America. And I know I've, I've talked to friends, I've talked to um, white counterparts who have said, man, come on, let's get over this. I mean, it's been years, you know, racism is, yeah, some people are racist or whatever, but slavery is over. Why are you guys still keeping this going? Like, stop already. Um, and that sort of is, is, is a bit disrespectful. I need you to understand that because um, we are not in the same, we don't have the same opportunity. We don't have the same uh, chance. Cohen believes that the experience of being both black and Christian incites a paradox. As a Christian, his faith inspires him to be hopeful about God's coming salvation and work in his life. As a black man, his life experiences under the evils of segregation and ever-present threat of death led him to despair. I, I want Courtney to share with us about the cross and the lynching tree because Jesus' death on the cross represents a similar paradox. And please share with us, Courtney, um, you just preached a powerful message and you alluded to this, this book and you referenced uh, James Cone. Everybody, please, like church, I want you to be well informed. Please read everything James Cone, get everything that he's written. Please get it and, and just read it. I want you to read Cornell West's Race Matters. I want you to read um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Uh, it's important that we're informed as a community. This is not just black people. Those of you who are our white me members, our beautiful white members, I want you to know too. Uh, so let's do our homework. Come on, Courtney, talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah, um, the book was so amazing and so relevant 
to me and and I didn't attend the um, a seminary or anything like that but as a black human being it was so relevant and it ministered to me in a way I also have frequented white spaces my whole life in my education I've attended white churches so um, I have heard messages I grew up in the black church so um, while neither are wrong growing up in black church it was about the blood it was about the cross the our 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 worship songs were not as like you know the the crown as much as it was the cross and in my white brother and sisters churches it was all about the crown and what we've had that we have the privilege of being this part of the new testament is that we know sunday comes right we don't i can't tell you what saturday feels like after jesus is crucified because i already know sunday's coming i've grown up knowing that resurrection happened so to identify with friday and to sit in friday is hard for many of my black brothers and sisters because they love jesus and they can't bear to think about jesus in friday so they go quickly to sunday um, but many of us in the black community said we live in Friday <laughs> and it's because of Friday we know that we have a savior that loves us with an everlasting love because he was willing to have Friday yeah. like we have right um, and so the 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 idea that the crucifixion of Jesus was just a first century lynching was so amazing to me and yet that concept to some of my white brothers and sisters would be blasphemous like how dare you minimize jesus to a lynching but the reality was is that's exactly what happened to him and it was legal <laughs> like we want to ask sit here and go like oh how horrible they did our jesus that way they did our jesus that way it was exactly how it was supposed to happen not just in prophecy but if they if he did what they claimed that he did that was his end that was how it was going to happen that's how it should have happened and that's what happened to many black people is this thing was legal it, it was almost as if everyone was invited to a lynching you got an invitation to lynching at church to bring your children to take photos and to sell photos of a black body hanging there often dismembered in front of your children now we talk about censorship now they took children to watch this black body and this was happening in church and it was okay and yet when it was time to try somebody nobody knew who did it <laughs> this was the system how is it that you have hundreds of people in attendance and in the newspaper an invitation and yet when it's time to get into the courtroom nobody can identify who did this this is the system this wasn't <laughs> this was the law they knew very well that they would not be tried for these things mm -hmm. and so when we look at jesus he went through things like they went through like we go through now, I don't want to compare my experience to someone who had a family member lynched, but I de definitely carry that in my DNA. I carry that that mindset. Uh, there's also another book, Pastor Mark, called Between the World and Me by Tanashi Coates. And he talks about this black and the black home, how we're overly disciplined to our children because we're trying to equip them to not lose their bodies as they leave our homes. So you see black parents very hard on black children because there's a constant reminder of who you have to be once you leave this house. I'm, you know, people say you get a whooping, I, I do it because I love you. And as a kid, you're like, mm, I don't know if I feel all that. But the truth is, is I'm trying to not get your body taken. So listen to me, you know, when I'm teaching you about how to listen to cops, I don't care if you're right or wrong. I'm trying to do everything I can to preserve your body. And so for our savior, to allow his body to be broken means that I have a Jesus and a, and, and a God that I can respect and that I can't say he doesn't understand me. So the book is amazing and I would suggest anybody wow. you know, read it. There's, I want to like, I need to read it again. I need to get more. It was happening so fast, I feel. Just talking to you guys makes me, I feel like I need to read some more. Uh, I got to get some more books. I want to read some more. I, I want to learn some some more. Thank you so much, and I'm so grateful uh, that you all have come on. I have to close out the conversation. I want to ask Pastor Juan 
uh, to speak out a little bit about this. Here's here's the question in closing, everybody. Thank you again for, for watching tonight. Uh, what lessons uh, do you feel that our nation, our churches, our races can take from this moment? Um, Pastor Mark, you talking about this conversation or just this moment in history? This, this moment in history, I should say. I, you know, I, I would hope that that sometime from now, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was said that in the midst of pandemics and protests and darkness, that somehow the church of Jesus Christ came together and, and God did something spectacular in our nation and in our midst. Um, I mean, you know, that, that would be my hope. That would be my desire. You know, as I'm, as I'm listening, I mean, I, I'm, man, I just, I want to spend more time. I want to spend more time with Courtney, with Pastor Todd, with Jordan, Pastor Harrison, just, just to continue to hear, continue to learn. Um, and I, we just need more of this, right? Because um, what happens is we, we, go from, we go from living an I, it kind of life where, where it's, it's, it's always them. And we begin to not intentionally dehumanize, but it's, it's the all black matter, black lives matter people or the all lives matter people. It's, it's the cops or it's, and it's, and it's, and if we're not careful, we, we, we embrace this I, it mentality when, when at the cross, what, what we've received is, is, is a, is a God who, who never even lived I it. And he, he had, I mean, and we were created, but he embraced this I thou. Yes. It's I thou. And, and we, we bring back not only the humanist, but the image of God implanted in every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. And so I, my hope, my desire is, listen, we, if anyone's going to get it right, it's got to be us. It's got to be us because, because you're my brothers and sisters, not in a racial sense, but in you're my brother and sister in Christ. Right, I mean, you're you're more blood to me than than my relative who 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 does not know Jesus, right? And so, if anyone's got to get it right, we've got to get it right. We we've got to get it right. We got to stop. We've got to stop being afraid, and um and learn to know what we don't know, and ask tough questions, and have meals, and um, spend time together. Now, I'm just I'm gonna call it out so it happened. But Pastor Todd already invited me over for some ice cream, so. <laughs> Now we, we get together, but I, I just, I just want to make sure he invited me over for ice cream. Cause I want some ice cream, but, uh, I want some ice cream too, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but that's really the heart, man. I, I think if we learn anything in our nation, there, there's gotta be, you know, there's gotta be another moment. There's gotta be another awakening. There's gotta be, and it's, and it, and, and the awakening cannot have, it can't just happen in the white church or the black church, because at the same time that the Jesus people movement was going on and they were experiencing revival, there were others marching in the streets, experiencing social, a social revival. And so how about we marry both planes of the cross, the vertical and the horizontal? How about we marry the message of, doc, of, of, uh, of Reverend uh, Billy Graham and the march of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? It doesn't have to be either or. It can be both and, right? And, um, and so let's marry the message and the march because the cross is only strongest at its nexus where the two meet. And so... Um, and so I just hope we get it right. If we don't get it right, if we don't get it right, those of us on this call, those of us in our churches, white, black, brown, Asian, if we don't get it right, I, I don't know that there's hope for our nation. I don't know that there's hope for our nation. If we don't get it right. Mm. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who came on here. Um, I, I'm so appreciative to, to, to Keisha and to Bishop Paramore, to uh, Pastor Harrison, to Jordan, um, Pastor Robles, Pastor Todd, Pastor Rivera, thank you, Courtney, I, I, I honor you. Um, to those of you who are watching from everywhere, black, white, uh, Hispanic, Asian, we love you. We are the body of Christ together, and um, we have to talk. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Um, we have to hurt each other to, to, to help each other sometimes. We have to hear each other. And I did, I'm just grateful that you all came on. I want to give you guys, if you don't mind, maybe about 60 seconds or so. 
and just give your you know, some final comments. And then I'm going to ask Pastor Juan if you will to close us out in prayer. I want to thank you, those of you who are watching. Uh, Pastor Harrison, you want to you want to start us off? Let me say to you, Pastor uh, Mark, thank you uh, for being um, kind enough to allow uh, us to come together and and be open and transparent and honest. Uh, which is something that is desperately needed. I am in agreement with Pastor Rivera because my generation is leaving. We're dying. We're getting older, which means this newer generation has got to get it right. And, and that, that, that might be a, a whole lot of weight to put on this generation. But if we, if we would have gotten it right, you would not have to get it right. And it's our responsibility as, as older saints to become that support mechanism to make sure that it gets done. Um, the Bible is clear about old, wise, young, strong. And we have to be able to build those coalitions together. And I believe that God has permitted the pandemic. I believe he has permitted uh, the racial issues that are taking place to remove the big I and the little you from the body of Christ. Mm. Every church, every pastor is on the same level. And I believe it's intentional uh, so that we can be focused on the body rather than focused on glorifying ourselves. Wow. Thank you so much. Courtney, you want to share with us? Uh, yes, I'm just taking notes because you guys all are so great and, and it's been a privilege to listen to you guys and thank you Pastor Mark for inviting us um, on this call. Um, I would just say I agree. Um, my hope is for courage um, in all of us, myself included, that the Holy Spirit will give me the strength to do what I need to do for the Lord outside of my own context or abilities that he would be supernatural um, and, and working through this church and working through individuals. And that I wouldn't be foolish or any of us be foolish to knock down what God is doing um, and to speak on behalf of what God is doing um, out of our own lenses. Um, so definitely courage and wisdom is my hope for the church um, and for ultimately for our, our world and our country. That's great. Pastor JP. I want to share a concept as we close here, and this is just for, uh, believe it or not, my father's Mexican, my mother's white, and I just want to address the white Christian listening to this right now. Uh, I heard a concept shared by Rich Velotis. He's a pastor out in New York who, he gave this lecture where he's talking about incarnational listening. And this is a canonic form of listening where you divest privilege, and that's a whole other topic that some people need to be a little bit educated on, on privilege, because some people just deny it. But I think once they think about it critically, they'll start to understand it. But my hope is that Christians, specifically white Christians, who have benefited from privilege and from social constructs that have given them a form of privilege because of their skin, I hope that they will begin to listen, first and foremost, listen to people of color. Uh, I, I really like that analogy that Pastor Todd gave earlier about Hey, I can tell you, he said, I can tell you what's wrong with my car. I just need you to help me push it. And I think we need white Christians to listen to Christians of color. They'll tell you what's going on. Uh, they'll help you understand. And I think, you know, this is the canonic movement of Christ that he had things that he, he didn't get up, give up his divinity, but he became like one of us. And I think that's what we need. I think in a culture that's sexist, I think men need to listen to women. I think in a culture of greed and exploitation, wealthy people need to listen to those who have been economically disenfranchised. I think in a culture that's still dealing with racism, colonialism, the lasting legacy of this, and how it has evolved, I think people who are white in the church need to listen to people who are of color. And I think if we don't do that, then we'll be participating in the sin of Thomas. You know, Thomas, he, he had this approach where he said, if I don't see it myself, I don't believe it. So if, if, if I haven't seen it, it's invalid. And I think we have to be careful. So my hope is for what I call a neo-evangelicalism. And I guess one of the attributes of that would be 
where white Christians listen to Christians of color. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Todd, you want to share with us? So powerful this night, uh, especially Courtney's last words. Uh, I couldn't stop thinking about my two boys, and I was actually hard on them today for the very reason, the fear, fear of what happens if you do wrong and I'm not around. Uh, I, almost had, I almost went off for a second because it really hit me, Courtney. Pastor Mark, I love you. Uh, you're not my friend. You're my brother. Uh, we've been down this journey for a long time. Uh, and to see you doing such a wonderful work, I'm so proud of you, and I honor you for bringing us together. My hope is very simple, and this didn't get touched on, but I think it's a clarion call to the church. People are afraid of the phrase Black Lives Matter, and they're more afraid of the organization Black Lives Matter, uh, because there are, you know, other principles and agendas that are attached to it, and people have their own right to have their own beliefs about how to affect change. What I would say to the church is, when you don't take the lead, somebody else will. When you don't take the lead, somebody else will. And if you're anxious about the slogans and the organizations behind it, just think to yourself, if you don't lead the nation, the world where it ought to go, you'll end up getting dragged somewhere you don't want to go. And so we have to take the lead in the direction that Jesus would have us to go to truly do justice, not just talk about it or make it a once a year proclamation, to truly unite and to build on what Pastor JP said, not only listen, but when necessary, follow. That's, that's, that's messianic work there. Jesus was nothing to look at, nothing, no one to listen to, of no report, but he had the best message the world had ever seen. And black people aren't the smartest, you know, better than anyone else, but this might be the season of last being first. And so if that's the season, uh, let's move in it. And to my black brothers and sisters, and I say this to myself because it's hard for me, when we finally do get listened to, let's accept that role as graciously as we hoped others would all the hundreds of years we've been listening to others. And we have been. And following. Uh, we have to be careful not to become what we despise. And that is a part of us coming together. And I struggle with that because sometimes you're so happy to be on top for a minute. You'll take that <laughs> platform and hit a few jabs when you can. So true unity is recognizing each other, loving each other, working together, and making sure this world is genuinely just for every human being. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much. Jordan, would you share with us? Yeah, I wanted to also thank you for inviting me to this conversation and thank everyone on this call. You guys are incredibly insightful. I learned a lot and also took some notes. Um, I would say my hope is that, um, number one, that people could really disarm themselves of disgust moving forward. And, and instead of saying, like, why do I hate this person, the question be could become, um, would I react the same if it were me, if it were my brother, if it were my sister? If, would, would, would my response be the same if I was looking in the mirror? Would my response be the same if I um, maybe had a forged $20 bill? Would I still be as um, nonchalant about murder if it was me, if it was my kid, um, if it was someone who looked like me? Um, and also just to piggyback off of Pastor JP, Pastor Todd and Courtney and everyone, I think we kind of all have the same hope. We really want to see the church lead in this area and do right by everyone and um, have the strongest voice and also the voice that is in line with God and what Jesus would do if he were here today. Um, and I think to a certain extent, we're missing the mark as a whole body of Christ. But my hope is to see us get back on track and really lead this conversation in a way that doesn't leave people out or behind or um, preach more about what we don't like um, instead of what we love. Amen. This conversation was uh, it ignited to clarify and to provide insight to the body of Christ on race, riots, and religion. And I pray that you all receive from this. I'm gonna ask Pastor Juan, if you will, would you give us uh, some final comments as well? And then even pray over us, pray over us as a church, as a as a family, as a community, as a people, um, that we can uh, 
mitigate through this and we can make it through this this time and that we will be stronger and, and our love would abound over hate. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for uh, for uh, inviting me and having me a part of this conversation as well and for uh, everyone on the call. Um, I love you. And, um, and, you know, my hope is that we would, as believers, that we would take the conversation off of our Facebook feed and have it over a cup of coffee or over a meal, preferably with someone that does not look like you. And, um, and just learn and just learn and just have the conversation. Um, and, uh, and that, that'll be a good next step. And so, um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's pray and, um, uh, and just, uh, just thank the Lord for this time and believe that, um, that we're going to be stepping into some prophetic moments because we're leaving some pathetic moments behind us. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy spirit. And Lord, there is a sense that we are living, God, in a Genesis 1-2 moment. God, where your word says that darkness covered the earth, deep darkness was on the face of the deep. And Lord, we feel this darkness. We feel, God, the spirits across the cities of America that wish to divide. God, that wish to, uh, to take, that wish to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Lord, we just want to declare, Father, that... Um, not only through just conversations like this, but through relationship, through your church coming together. God, that that Genesis 1-2 moment will be met with a Genesis 1-3 moment. God, where you declared, let there be light in the midst of the darkness. And so Lord, I pray, Father, for your church. I pray, God, for those that are watching, God, those that are followers of Jesus Christ, the light of the world that came to this earth 2,000 years ago. And John says that the darkness can never extinguish it. God, that we would shine bright in the midst of this pathetic season, that we would rise up as a prophetic church. God, to be light in the midst of darkness. God, that you would do something incredible in our day and in our generation as Pastor Harrison, God, has even declared God, that we've, as the next generation, we've got to take on, Father, the mantle. We've got to take on, Father, this fight. And we pray in Jesus' name, God, that we would get it right for our children and our children's children. So, Father, we ask that you'd be with us, God, be, God, in this region, the greater Youngstown World region. God, help us as leaders in this community. God, if you would enable us, Father, to build a prototype, God, in our community that could be duplicated in community, communities across our state, God, and even across our nation. God, that you would do something, God, in this region that brings the church together and that, God, with one voice, we can be light and, God, lead the way in seeing change, God, in our nation. We thank you. We submit ourselves to you. We love you and we trust you, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, was that amazing or what? What a powerful conversation. Race, riots, and religion. Hey friend, look at me. Whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Indian, African, you are precious in the sight of God. God loves you and so do I and so does the Light Church. The Light Church exists to share the light, the love, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not one complexion. The kingdom of God, man, is is so big. It's bigger than just one race, everybody. We need each other, and I need you. Look at me, all my white members, I need you. All my black members, I need you. Hispanic, you know I need you. Come on, we need to all come together, and we wanna love on each other, but at the same time, there's some challenges that our nation is, 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 is going through. Even as a black man in, in America, it's different than being a white man in, in America. A, a black woman is different from being a white woman. We have different experiences. It's not a, so much a bad thing, but at the same time, we need, to, we need to talk about it. We need to communicate. And we're not going to avoid the hard conversations. I believe that's what helps us to grow and to foster great, strong relationships. So we thought it would be best for us to share a critical conversation on race, riots, and religion, considering all that's going on 
within our, our nation. I know y'all want me to, to say something about Kanye West. I want you to know I'm praying for Kanye. I know many of y'all want me to, to have a critical conversation about it. And those of you feel some type of way, um, it, it's a great opportunity to talk about mental health. It is a great opportunity. And I believe that's just as important. You need Jesus and therapy. Look at me. You need Jesus and therapy. And I believe that. So, so much is going on in our world. We want to talk about different things, but I'm just so glad that you guys tuned in today. I pray you were blessed. Thank you for giving. I know you're going to give. If you, if you can, man, why not give $20 tonight? Those of you who have never given before, put a seed into this soil. Help us to continue to bless people. I'm so excited. Don't forget on this weekend, everybody, August 2nd, it's going to be explosive. Now, if you miss it, that's on you. But we're getting ready to do this powerful communion, oh, virtual communion celebration. It's going to be awesome. We've prepared for you. I want you to tune in, invite your friends, family from all over the world. Tell them 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, the place to be is the lightchurch.us. Subscribe to our channel right now. Come on, send this out to somebody. Subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and hit the bell. I want to keep you notified of everything that's going on in our church. I pray that God continue to bless you through the pandemic. I speak life over you. That even no matter what's going on in your life, I speak blessings over you. Y'all get ready in August. We're going back to Bible study. I got to pour into you. I got to share into you. But more so, I want to speak to relationships. I'm doing this thing on Wednesday for married couples. Look at me. I'm going to be speaking into married couples for the first two Wednesdays. And then the next two Wednesdays, we're going to focus on singles. Now, you want to come into these conversations. This is going to be powerful. You don't want to miss it, everybody. Married people on the first two Wednesdays. The next two Wednesdays, we're dealing with singles. I want to make sure that you stay connected with us. Guys, don't forget on Tuesday, I want to meet all of you guys. August is the 4th, everybody. Man, it's going to be amazing. All the gentlemen, it's just going to be explosive. So don't miss it. I love you guys, and we'll see you next time. God bless you, friends.